The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us begin our worship with our prayer. <laughs> Once again, good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Forest Presbyterian Church where we live in God's heart, hands, and voice. It is good to see all of you this morning. Uh, we have a couple of announcements uh, for the life of our church. Jen? Good morning. Earlier in the summer, we got really inspired by um, the youth and what they had learned about joy. Um, this summer and so we started a project um, where you guys could send in pictures expressing things that were bringing you joy. I had no idea what kind of response we would get but the response has been overwhelming and we are starting to put something together. John and I are working on it and we'll have a big unveiling of this slideshow later in August right around the time that school starts. But I wanted to give you just a tiny little sneak preview today to encourage anybody who has not sent pictures in yet to please do, you still have time. I'd like to get them this week. 
um, so we can start pulling things together. So if you've got some pictures you want to send, please do them this week. But just to show you some of what we are getting. We had the Baston family at the beach having a lot of fun. But you may not want to send a picture of yourself. Maybe you feel, you know, self-conscious about sending a picture of yourself and seeing it up on the screen. Um, so someone of your children, ha, they don't care. They'd be happy to see themselves up there. Um, or maybe you just want to send something beautiful that you've seen. Uh, that is, we've got a lot of beautiful pictures of things like that. And the Eiffel Tower, where the Colliers have been this summer in Paris. And of course the beach. I think everybody recognizes that crew right there. And um, let's see, a lot of people have sent in pictures of their pets, which has been really fun. They don't mind being up there, so that would be a fun thing to send as well. And um, we've been near and far, and um, one of the things I'm hoping is that it'll generate some conversation about, hey, tell me about that. You know, I want to hear about that experience. So. Um, please send your pictures. They can be wide-ranging, as you can see. I'd love to have them this week. I believe my information is in the bulletin where you can send those. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. Ah, <laughs> back from vacation. You know, while I was on vacation, the church was always on my mind. And I got into discussions with a couple of people. And they said, how about some fundraising? Why don't you do some fundraising? I thought, man, what a great idea. We, we do the, stu the uh, yard sale for the, the youth group. How about some other things? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, challenge you all to put down on a piece of paper a fundraiser, just has to be one, that you think would help the church make some money. Now, it's not just putting down the name, I want to do a a dinner, or I want to do a pancake breakfast. I, I want you to tell me how you would go about doing that. I'm not saying you have to do it, but if you could tell me how you think that should be done, that would be great. And then we'll go on from there and see what happens. Thanks. Uh, two other other stewardship ideas. Um, one, you'll see the uh, Kroger Rewards program. If you haven't signed up for that, um, do uh, do sign up for that. You can you can put Forest Presbyterian as your uh, giving as as where they will they'll send. Um, and I think it's like four percent according to Sue. It's it's uh, so it it is a worthwhile thing to do. Also, um, as, as we said last week, we're we're running behind on our donations because this is summertime, and and um, so we need to make up about a two thousand dollars shortfall uh, each each month. A lot of you have responded. Thank you uh, for doing that. Um, please do continue to do that. This is this is a long term thing, uh, not a short term thing. And in, in past years, we might have sent out a letter asking for more. Uh, donations temporarily. We're, we're saying, you know, try to make this into a long-term uh, commitment, but thank you for, for responding to that. And if you are just now learning about this, um, we're asking folks to just, at, at minimum, try to give $50 more a month. But if, if you can do more than that, if God has blessed you with more, please, uh, please do give more. Uh, today is also a day uh, for for giving, you guys have been super generous uh, this in this summertime. Uh, the Operation Pack-A-Bag ends today. 
but if you'll notice in the commons, the uh, table back there is, is full. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Den where's Denise? We, uh, um, it, would you say this is more than? More, okay, good. That, uh, so this is, this is more than last year, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we will, we will pray for that during the uh, offertory time today, that that will, will bless folks in our area. God has blessed us uh, to be here to worship. Let's, uh, let us uh, stand for our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. We seek the kingdom of God. Where the smallest seeds turn into great plants. We seek the kingdom of God, as precious as pearls or treasure. We seek the kingdom of God, where joy and abundance reign. Glorious God, your generosity floods the world with goodness, and you shower creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for food to satisfy both body and heart, that in the miracle of being fed, we may be empowered to feed the hungry in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn five, God the Sculptor of the Mountains. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin to God. Spirit, intercede when we fall short of your glory, when we do not deserve your promises, when we do not act like those who have been called your family. Spirit, intercede when our words wound, when our silence speaks volumes, when our actions are far cry from what you would have us do. Spirit, intercede. Break forth into our lives, forming us into the image of your Son, that we might never feel separate from you again. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 
May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. If you ever wanted to know how long it takes for me to walk from here to the office and back, it's the Gloria Patri. That's how long it takes. Uh, at this time, I would ask uh, Lindsay and Sherry Bennett to come forward and stand here. You can stand up here. You can stand up here. So uh, we, we ordained and installed the rest of our elders and deacons, and Lindy, Lindsay and uh, Sherry are, are here to be ordained and installed today. Uh, so we are, we are glad that they have uh, heard the call to, to uh, leadership, and we uh, want to ordain and install them at this time. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Ordination calls the whole church to be to renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. And so I ask uh, these questions to you as, uh, as we ordain you today. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Christ, Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture? Will be, you be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do, do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And for you, Sherry, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love of, and justice of Jesus Christ? 
And Lindsay, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to, be the, to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Do we, the members of the church, accept these elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Amen. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Amen. This time I would ask uh, those who have been previously uh, ordained to come forward as they uh, kneel to, to place uh, hands upon them. John Bates, this means you too. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for your steadfast fast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you announced prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, Deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O oh God, and for the church of, of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, and especially upon Sherry and Lindsay today, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world, sustain this congregation in, the, in ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sherry and Lindsay, you are now deacons and el a deacon and an elder in the church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen. Welcome. And now as we welcome uh, Sherry and Lindsay into ordained ministry, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another.
Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 128, which can be found on page 536 in your pew Bible. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy, and it shall go well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Without any of our smallest members uh, here today, uh, we will move forward to the uh, scripture text this morning. Uh, let us uh, turn together uh, to Matthew 13, beginning with verse 31. Let us pray as we approach God's word this morning. Lord God, we are thankful today for your word and for the stories that you tell. Help to open our minds and our hearts to what you are saying to us so that we can understand what you would have us do and how you would have us live. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household 
who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Jesus had a very simple message to the people when he began his ministry, when he began preaching. He preached the repentance for the forgiveness of sins and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reign of God is at hand. That ministry, uh, that, that, that uh, message continued throughout his ministry. Here we hear him talk about the kingdom in these several parables that are in the text. Now, you, like me, you probably learned about similes in school. The difference between a simile and a metaphor uh, was one word, and that was the word like, right? Like or as. So there are lots of metaphors in the Bible, but these that Jesus tells are similes. He means to compare two things, to compare the kingdom poetically to something else so that we can understand and have some idea of what the kingdom might be or what the kingdom might be like to get some insight, some clue as to this thing that is breaking into the world because the kingdom is at hand, but it's not yet. It's coming into being, but it's not here yet. It is on the way. The kingdom is the message that speaks of the reign of God, of the time when God will reign over all of us, when God will reign over all of the earth, over all humanity. Right now, people reign over one another. But one day, God will fully reign on this earth. And this is good news. Theocracies have been tried in human history, but those theocracies were false. They were the reign of people over one another, of people in power over one another. Even as great as Geneva was in the 1500s under John Calvin, people have described that as the closest thing to the kingdom on earth, people in its own era. It was nothing close to what this is going to be like. Even John Calvin could not approach the kingdom. The kingdom that we're hoping for and longing for is when God will reign over us fully, as Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, God's will is fully and completely done every moment. On earth, not so much. So we have something to look forward to in this. It is us fully obedient to God, us fully fulfilling the will of God, us following God in every way. In the hopes of the kingdom and the ways that it's beginning to open up to us now, Jesus tells us these parables. These are stories that are thrown before us and their meaning is meant to challenge us, to expand our consciousness and our understanding of God and who God is. Now, at my house, we have a back porch that backs up onto a small section of woods that our neighborhood designated long ago to be a bird sanctuary. And luckily, the birds uh, are there. The birds do come to this, these, this copse of woods that are behind our house. And there are a couple of trees that I really want to trim down. I really want to cut these trees down that are... Uh, getting nearer to the porch uh, every year. These trees are getting bigger than I had hoped for them to get. But every time that I think about chopping off limbs and, and chopping trees, I begin to think of the birds. Because I can sit back there or sit in my den and look out in the mornings and I can see the cardinals come and sit in these trees. And I love to see the cardinals come and sit in the trees. That's very relaxing for me. And I I saw some again this week, which is a good sign to me whenever I see the cardinals come back. We see other birds back there, robins, uh, just all kinds of birds in in the backyard. Those trees started out as small and they're getting much bigger and they are welcoming those cardinals each and every day. So it is with the first parable that Jesus tells of the mustard seed. Big things come in small packages when it comes to faith. 
The mustard seed to me is about welcoming and making space for others. It's about the ways that our faith can grow in expansive and unexpected ways. The method for this growth is personal growth through trust and obedience to God, to be planted in God's grace, but there is no limit to what that grace can grow into. God envisions the kingdom for us as big and expansive, as giving shade to many people. If you've been outside over the last few days, shade is the thing that you want. So it is here with this parable, God giving respite and shade, cool to the world, something that the world can find shelter in. This is what the kingdom will be like, shelter and welcoming for the world. That's a good thing. Now, during the pandemic, the pa over the past three, particularly three years ago, uh, people began to do something that they had not done uh, probably for a generation. And that was people began to bake bread. How many of you baked bread during the pandemic? Yeah. How many of you ba baked sourdough bread? Sourdough bread was the big thing. Yeah. Everybody wanted to get a sourdough starter going. Everybody wanted a, a sourdough starter, so people began to bake. People that had either never baked in their lives or had not baked for a long time. Good bread, really good bread, is alive. A starter means that bread is alive. It's ironic that people had one thing that they, that they couldn't see they were trying to get away from, and had another thing that they couldn't see that they were trying to keep around and trap. This is the life that God was giving to people in the midst of our challenges. The thing about yeast is once you get it going, it's going. You can't stop it. Once it is alive and eating, you can't stop. And this lady has got things going because she has not got just a little bit going. She's got a lot going. Three measures of flour. I think that's more than just three cups of flour. Three measures is more. You see, that's the amount in Genesis 18 that Sarah used to serve her angelic guests as they visited Sarah and Abraham. Our baker in this story is preparing not only for themselves, they're not just baking bread, but they are breaking, baking bread for a group, baking bread for others. The kingdom is about this invitation and hospitality, an unsparing celebration of hospitality, an un, uh, uncaring about how much is given, making more than is needed. This is what the kingdom will be like. It will be like an outpouring of generosity. Now, have you ever had something that you bought, but you didn't care about the price? Something you bought that you were going to buy it no matter what that thing cost. It may be like when you go to the movies now. Uh, every time I go to the movie, I'm surprised by the cost of a ticket. If it's a movie that I really want to see, I probably don't care. Or maybe it's your favorite book that's coming out. New books cost more than books that have been around a long time. But you want to know what happens next, and you will pay any price to find out what happens next in that book. The kingdom represents the ultimate value in life, our ultimate collective goal. If repentance is the goal for us personally, individually, the kingdom is our goal collectively. What are we willing to do to be part of it, and what are we willing to part with to be part of it? Jesus thinks it's about giving all that we have to achieve. What's holding us back? 
Wealth may be holding us back from the things that we should really desire. Selling what we have to get a measure of that sounds silly. But it must be big in order to give up everything. It must be big to give up everything for the kingdom. Another item that is uh, not that uh, valuable when it comes to uh, price uh, would be uh, like my wedding ring. My wedding ring, if you took it to the jeweler, uh, would probably not give you very much for this ring. It has gold in it, uh, and it is nice enough, but the, this ring has a price that uh, is priceless to me. If you took it away from me, I would be willing to do just about anything to get it back, just about anything to take it back away from you. Jewelry is the same here. We have seen uh, this merchant looking for a pearl. Valuable uh, jewelry was probably one of their main stores of value. It would be the easiest thing to put value in uh, other than a coin. But coins can get uh, clunky to have uh, too many around. And currency could change with a whim depending on the leader. But these were kind of valuables that didn't change. If you had a pearl, that pearl didn't change. It didn't rot, didn't go away. For this merchant to sell all, the ha all that he has, he's going to go and get that pearl. He's going to sell his entire stock to get one item. But he does complete the transaction. He does make it happen. In both of these stories, the thing that they are buying is value that only they can understand, value that the world can't understand. But they are willing to go and do it. They are willing to be committed, willing to reach out. And when it goes, comes to fishing, it's the next parable about the fish. I have never fished with a net. I've never cast a net off a boat and just brought in fish. And I've told uh, my few fishing stories that I have from, particularly from southwest Georgia, they, they, they're not many stories that I have. I just remember there was one time when little Morgan and I went with uh, our, our friend uh, Mr. John down in, in south Georgia and he took us out to Lake Seminole and little Morgan cast off the boat and he, uh, he got a bite and he pulled it in and man it looked like a big fish. I mean it was the biggest fish that any of us had caught for the day and I thought wow and it sort of looked sort of looked like a bass but it was not a bass it was one of the fish that in those lakes you just don't really want to catch because you really can't cook it and eat it's very hard to eat not great my, my friend grabbed it, he says no 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 we're not taking no we're not taking that home no he took it off and he threw it back into the lake. The kingdom is about trolling for everyone, trying to bring everyone into the fold, not leaving out anyone from the fold. We don't worry about the outcome of who gets brought into the boat in that sense. We want everyone to believe and everyone to come along. The outcome of that is up to God. We talked about that last week when we talked about the wheat and the tares. Just like we must, when we read that, that story from Jesus, we must with this story uh, not be stuck thinking that every fish has to remain the same. Imagine that fish that we pulled into the boat, maybe that fish could change into a bass or a brim instead of whatever that fish was. The same uh, for people. People are not stuck being good or bad. Jesus is talking about the results of a life in these people that are pulled into the boat. So not every fish is stuck being a bad fish. Now you've heard all of these stories. We've talked a little bit about all of these parables. Uh, Jesus, as a good teacher, checks in on the understanding of his class. 
his disciples. He wants to check in to see if they have understood what he has said. And so he asked them point blank, have you understood this? And they say, yes. Now, I think the answer that Jesus was hoping they would say is, whew, that was some tough teaching. Could you explain that a little more? Could you say a little more of that? No, they just say, yes. Now, I think this yes is a bit of an unsure yes, because I don't think they understand exactly what it is they're answering. I might have answered the same way. I'm not uh, putting the disciples down. I probably would have answered the same way. I would say, yes. Have you understood what I was saying? Yes. But in truth, these parables are meant to make us think over and over again. Every time you would see one of these parables, you're supposed to think of something new to get some kind of new insight into it, some new sliver of what the kingdom will be like. You are not supposed to just be definite on everything that you've heard today in these stories, particularly since uh, in some of these he doesn't offer a lot of explanation. And what Jesus says in response to their yes uh, should make us think that the disciples are uh, like the scribe uh, who is called to sort out uh, what Jesus is saying uh, for our lives, that we're called to sort that out. And the disciples uh, should understand that they uh, are being sorted out in this way. He says, the master of the household who brings out his treasure, what is old and what is new. What I have uh, understood in, as I have translated this word new in the New Testament over the years, there's, there are a couple words for new in the, in the New Testament in Greek. This is the word, once again, that means new to you. New to you. It's not something that's uh, new in the sense of newly made, but it's new to you. It may have been around a long time, but it's the first time you've seen it and heard it. So we say old and new does not exactly mean old and new. It might mean the former and the latter. The used, the already used, and the not used. Or as they uh, say, pre-owned and not pre-owned. Not new and new to me. Known, already known and unknown. Because the disciples are supposed to be the scribes who search through these teachings to sort out what Jesus is saying for our lives. We must constantly wrestle with this to find what is new and old. What is used and not used. So here are four things for us as we move away from these parables to think about. The first is the kingdom and these parables should upend some things in our lives. If these parables don't disturb you in some way, disturb something in your life, try to read them again. Because they should upend you and disturb you in some way. They should make you think. The second is that the kingdom supports genuine faith and obedience. This, this view of the kingdom is pointing us back to our genuine trust in God and our genuine attempts to obey. Third, the kingdom should in some way renew our faith. That new that Jesus is talking about with the disciples should be some type of renewal. Our faith may get old and our faith may need to be renewed. It won't be completely new, but it can be renewed. It can be made new, recreated for us. The kingdom also makes room for new faith. New faith in God within ourselves and new faith for others. This was the great hope of the kingdom for Christ that all would be brought in, that all would hear. Because our ultimate hope is in the kingdom. Our ultimate hope is in God breaking into this world more and more each day. 
We are a kingdom people. We proclaim the kingdom. We proclaim Christ and his kingdom. We are proclaiming something at work among the people, something at work among those that God has created, something at work among those that Christ has saved, something at work among us. So may we leave this place, having read these parables, having understood them, in a way where we reach out to others so that they can know that the kingdom is at hand, to proclaim that same message, to be like that tree, that mustard tree that is giving shade, to be like the woman who has poured out three measures of flour so that she can reach out and serve with hospitality. May we pass on the faith of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so thankful for your teaching for us today. We know that our understanding is dark and dim, but you can shine and give us more light through your Holy Spirit. So shine the light of understanding upon your word today that more and more we can see what your kingdom will be like and how your kingdom is breaking into this world right now. Through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Um, I'll lead us in the prayers of the people and then give you a moment uh, as we close the prayer to lift up prayers on behalf of our neighbors and the world. Let us pray. Loving God, you've poured out your grace and mercy upon us to know of your kingdom, to hear of its coming. We pray today for more and more of that kingdom in our world. We pray that the thirsty would have water to drink, the hungry would have food to eat, poor would have enough, the oppressed would find justice, the sick would be healed, the lonely will find your presence, those in despair will find hope, we pray for peace in this world, that the wars we see escalate around the world will break out in peace, a peace that only you can give, where we no longer study war, but instead beat our swords into plowshares and learn peace at your feet. We pray for those who are grieving today and pray for your comfort. We pray for those who lead us, our president, our Congress, our courts, for all who lead us here in the Commonwealth, and those who lead and serve us locally as well. We come today with many on our hearts and on our minds, and we lift them up out loud to you now.
Lord, hear our prayers. We ask that you would send us out as seed for your kingdom, as yeast for the leaven of the bread of life that only you can give. Make us your people and send us to fulfill your prayers that you pray through us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. God has been gracious to us. God has poured out his blessings upon us. Let us return thanks with our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Gracious God, you give us pearls and fish, birds and bushes, trees, mountains, everything in this world comes from you and your goodness and your hand. We give you thanks for the many blessings in our lives and for the way that you provide for us each day. We ask that you would cause us and these gifts to follow you. 
to seek your will and to walk in your ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 846, Fight the Good Fight. And now go forth, cast your nets, be a tree planted and become shade for others. Be the light of the world and the salt that is for the kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.